I'm very pleased to get to introduce Josh Tenenbaum, who will be our next speaker. And um, I think Josh is somebody that a lot of us uh, know his work, and um, he's a professor at MIT. Um, and he's done work which has been, I think, equally influential in both cog science psychology and also in computer science and AI. And that's why I think it's really exciting to have a meta workshop like this, um, where we really want to talk about both of those things and how they come together. Um, and really, there's no one that I can think of that is better um, at bridging that gap than Josh. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're in for a treat. Um, Josh has been somebody that has inspired me in, in a lot of ways. Whenever I hear his talks, I feel like he captures the, the fullness of intelligence better than almost anyone else uh, and really makes me think this is just the most exciting thing to work on. Um, so with that, uh, let's hand it over to Josh. And actually, one quick comment is we still have a link on the website where you can submit questions for the panel discussion at the end of the day. So please use that if you have questions. OK, so let's welcome Josh. Hi. Hi. Um, great to see everybody there, or sort of know you there at least. <laughs> and thanks, Philip, for that beautiful introduction. And thanks to all the organizers for an amazing workshop. It's the treat is all of ours, really. OK, let me share my screen here. All right. Um, everybody can hear me OK? All right, great. So um, I'm going to be talking about reverse engineering core common sense. And it, you know, it's, it's great to be in a workshop that um, is, so, is so, uh, such an inspiring topic and so topically organized, because I think you'll see many common themes with the speakers before and the ones who are going to come next. So the organizers challenged us to address this question, how close are we to the common sense of a toddler? And by that, I think they have in mind, and certainly I've had in mind, things like the intuitive physics and intuitive psychology that you can see in videos like this, which I've shown in many talks, I'm sure some of you have seen, many other people show this video too, uh, but it's, it's still always worth looking at. And it's amazing to ask, what would it take to build a machine that had this kind of common sense understanding of objects to be able to play with blocks or stack up cups like a child, to be able to make a plan that involves making a stack of two cups, to put it on a stack of three cups, to be able to debug the plan like you're seeing here when it doesn't quite go according to plan. And it's, you know, to me, I get inspired all over again every time I watch it. We have robots that are increasingly doing, you know, amazing things in the real world of objects, but nothing even remotely like this. Right? Or when we think about intuitive psychology, again, a very famous video by the psychologist, uh, for, from the psychologist Felix Wernicken and Michael Tomasello, where another 18 month old now is the participant in the experiment, the kid in the back, and he's seeing an action that he's never quite seen before. And yet he's literally able to read this person's mind to figure out what they wanted, what they were trying to do, and even how to help. And again, every time we have watched this video, it's, it strikes me all over again how sweet it is and cute that kid is, um, but really just how intelligent and how much common sense it requires building on common sense physics, but also just understanding people's goals and actions and plans to be able to do what you're seeing here. And we have to ask again, if we could build robots that could be this kind of help around the house, you know, that would be amazing. All right. But again, I think it's pretty clear that if we address the basic question, how close are we to this? We are far from this. <laughs> we are very, very, very far. So I want to start off by talking about what some of the gaps are um, and then talk about some of the very small steps that we've been starting to take to try to close those gaps. Um, again, like some of the other speakers, I think we have to recognize that the common sense we're talking about here isn't just, at least at, at, the, at the infant or young toddler stage, is not really distinctively human. A lot of it is shared with many other animals. So it's not only kids, human kids that can play with Legos, but uh, you know, this orangutan here from another famous video, um, crows or other smart corvid species of birds are incredibly good physical reasoners and tool users. Um, up on the top, you're seeing the famous mouse versus cracker video, um, a valiant struggle that uh, looks like it's not going to pay off for the mouse, but in the end actually ends happily. Or a video down on the bottom, which probably many of you have seen because like 27 million people, well, probably 28 million now, have recently watched this on YouTube. Um, but if you haven't, uh, you might check out the Squirrel Ninja Obstacle Course. It's a great way to spend 20 minutes 
Um, if you have young kids or maybe just yourself, that 20 minutes might turn into 200 minutes. Please don't start till the end of the talk. And you'll also see that this is, while this was a great YouTubers um, project, it also builds on other actual research that has been done for some years. The key is though, or the point is that the basic ability to navigate a world of physical objects is not uniquely human. And it is a very far from what our machines are doing today. So what do I think is missing? Well, here are two big things that are missing. And it really comes from the fact that, that you know, most of the dominant work these days, you know, certainly um, a lot of the work in the computer vision community, um, work I've contributed to, so I'm, not, I'm certainly not a, opposed to this kind of work. But I think we all have to recognize the major limitations of a strongly machine learning based approach to trying to build common sense. Because we have these two challenges. Common sense requires being able to generalize to an infinite range of new tasks with essentially no retraining or fine tuning. There's a lot of work that's being, that's being done. And again, good progress is being made on meta learning or ways of you know, training on some tasks and then retraining or fine tuning quickly to other tasks. But in a sense, to human common sense, there almost is no task. <laughs> and I'll, I'll try to show some examples of that in a bit. Or to the extent that they're tasks, they're tasks that we make up for ourselves. And that's part of the common sense, okay. Um, it, it also requires being able to generalize to environments that are vastly different from the training sense, again, with essentially no retraining or fine tuning. You know, there was a great question in, 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 after the first talk by Liz Spelke, the question was from Chris Atkinson uh, asking, are your stimuli ecologically plausible, uh, re realistic? Because they're so different in many ways, very simplified or strange compared to the real world. But to me, as a cognitive scientist, that is what is so striking, is that we can generalize not just to tasks, but to environments and ways the world could look that are really just, you know, so strikingly different, and yet they share certain abstract properties with the world, and that's what common sense is about. So here's another video of a baby playing with blocks. This is an even younger baby, a little bit less popular than the one I showed before, but quite, at least in AI talks, but quite popular on the internet because it's got both a baby and a cat. And here you see this baby, again, stacking up cups, but in an unusual way, what they seem to be doing is stacking up cups on the back of a cat. Somehow they decided that the most interesting thing they could be doing at that moment is just tr something like trying to figure out how many cups could they fit onto the back of a cat. They successfully fit three. Um, when they go for a fourth though, that, that plan goes wrong and then, um, and then it starts to go really wrong. But being very adaptive, <laughs> um, the baby appears to switch their goal and now it's how can I get the cups to the other side of the cat? <laughs> Maybe an easier to achieve goal. Um, again, like that's just as um, readily available uh, for object cognition and common sense planning as the much more familiar cup stacking. Or take these two uh, sets of snapshots that I took from a toddler of my acquaintance. Actually, now he's, he's six or seven. But at the time, he was about 20 months. Um, and here he is on the playground doing the things that kids do, which is using the playground not for the intention, <laughs> but a task it was intended for. So this is a thing that you're supposed to spin around, but he decides to use it for climbing. Right? and climbing in a really crazy way that none of our robots right now are able to do. Maybe with the right kind of, um, you know, with extensive experience training in Mujoko, you could get a robot to do this kind of thing in simulation. But he just did it right out of the bat. Or another kind of flexible common sense object manipulation and planning. Um, he took to the slide, but in an interesting way, um, he took this uh, toy shopping cart and decided to take it to the top of the slide and then to take it down the slide. <laughs> and I'm only showing you a few frames, but he, he successfully navigated all the way down, both himself and the shopping cart down the slide. As far as I know, he'd never seen anybody do this or never tried this himself. Where he got the idea, well, that's, 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 that's also something worth speculating on. But just the ability to both form that goal and then successfully execute the plan shows a kind of task adaptability that our current systems Really, it's, it's really even, I feel, beyond the paradigm of the current task-oriented approach in machine learning. On the topic of generalizing to environments, well, you know, again, there's many, many things we could see, and we'll see a lot of this in a bit when I show you some of the stimuli from the experiments we use. But just to cite one example, consider basketball, you know, a great area where computer vision has made progress. And it's just an area where there's, of course, physics, but there's also intuitive psychology goals, multi-agents, okay? A lot of interesting vision problems. But humans are able to analyze the dynamic scene of a basketball game, well, if it's a real basketball game, viewed from a somewhat familiar angle, 
or a very unfamiliar angle, you know, an angle that nobody's ever actually been in. The first time you see a shot like this, you're still able to make sense of it, even though none of us have ever been in that position, that viewpoint ourselves. Somehow that's a kind of generalization uh, out of the training viewpoint that, you know, is just zero shot, right? But requires a grasp on the three-dimensional structure of the world, as well as the physics and the common sense goals and plans. But it's not just there. Think about all the other ways that a basketball game could appear, like in video games. That could include realistic uh, imagery video games or somewhat less realistic imagery where this guy is slam dunking at a height that even I think the greatest of all slam dunk artists probably never quite attained, or even less realistic. You could have a basketball video game in Minecraft, or you could have it in an old style Atari game, or you could have it in a really old style Atari game. <laughs> And it doesn't matter. You still understand it in exactly the same common sense terms. And, you know, we don't have anything, any of our current computer vision systems to think that they would be trained on the real world scene from the left and generalized to all those scenes out of the box. It just doesn't fit with our current paradigm. So we need to think about something different. Now, again, as, as uh, many in this workshop, I'm not a developmental psychologist myself, although I do collaborate with some of the best developmental psychologists out there and some of my favorite colleagues and friends are in that field and I'm happy that some of them are even speaking here. And I think what we've all learned is that we have to rethink some of the basic ideas that go back to the beginnings of computer science and AI because this dream of building a machine that starts like a baby and learns like a child is the oldest dream of our field. Turing famously articulated it in the same 1950 paper where he introduced the Turing test, right? Um, but, you know, as we've learned, uh, the, the idea that children start off as something like a blank slate with really, really simple learning mechanisms that Turing takes as the natural first starting hypothesis, that just isn't right. So we've learned that children start off with a lot more and their learning mechanisms are a lot more sophisticated. So you heard a lot about some of the things that children start off with from Liz and the idea of core knowledge systems. And you'll hear more about that, uh, I think from Linda Smith and others later. And, um, and when it comes to um, what are the learning mechanisms, well, again, you'll hear um, a little bit about this from me. You've heard some about it uh, from the last talk and from Dan, and you'll hear uh, a lot from Allison, um, also Allison Gottnick after lunch. Okay, so the idea that, that you might call on the learning side, the child is scientist or model builder, that children aren't just like um, statisticians, uh, soaking up patterns in big data, but they actively form hypotheses, theories, test them. Sometimes children's play can be understood as like doing experiments to test the bounds of your limit. And then thinking of building an internal intuitive theory as something like a kind of model building process. And now I'll talk about some computational ideas that we've been developing, such as what the slogans here are the game engine in the head or the child is coder or as we like to say in, at MIT, the child is hacker, which are ways to take some of these I ideas and insights from developmental psychology and generalize and apply them to um, uh, in an engineering sense. Oh, and I should also mention Laura Schultz, who's here on, on my slide. Um, she's not in this workshop, but her ideas have been very influential on many of the things I'm talking about, and especially what I was saying earlier about the idea about um, uh, the, 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 the centrality of children's uh, goals and the ability and the amazing range of goals that children can set for themselves, the role that plays in learning, that's, that's an idea that she's been exploring in really interesting ways recently. And I don't, I don't really have much time to talk about that work, but I, I highly recommend you um, checking it out. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, our, what we're going to try to do is take is develop engineering accounts of core knowledge systems and how they might be learned um, we've been working on this in an intuitive physics setting, as well as the kind of intuitive psychology setting. I'm mostly just going to talk about intuitive physics here for reasons of time. And I want to use this to illustrate those some of the kinds of uh, computational building blocks that we think are necessary. So one is, uh, you, know, you can think of it as new kinds of AI programming languages. In the same way that um, deep learning has a formal mathematical language and has programming languages like TensorFlow or PyTorch, I think that to, to engineer common sense, we also need new kinds of mathematical formalisms and the associated programming language toolkits. And for us, probabilistic programs is our, what we think of as our, as our best hope there right now. So for those of you who aren't familiar with probabilistic programs or probabilistic programming, you could think of this as a way, again, mathematical ideas and 
software tools for integrating a number of our best ideas and intelligence that have arisen over different eras of the field going back decades, not all of which fit so neatly into the neural network paradigm or tool set. So that includes in addition to neural networks for pattern recognition and function approximation, which the most modern uh, probabilistic programming languages incorporate, but includes most importantly, symbolic languages for abstract knowledge representation and reasoning, you know, probably the best, the first good idea of AI and arguably I think the best, the one in which we wouldn't have, if we didn't have symbolic languages like math and, and programming, we wouldn't have any of these other ideas. Um, and then there's the idea of Bayesian inference in probabilistic models, especially causally structured models, so that we can reason about unobserved causes from very sparse, uncertain patterns of data. Not just learn functions or classifiers, but actually understand what the data is telling us. Now, there have been a number of generations of probabilistic programming languages, and I don't have time to really cover them here, but I want to just point you to a few, such as Pyro, developed inside Uber AI Labs, but open source, and TensorFlow Probability, developed inside Google, or Gen, developed in Vikash Mansinga's probabilistic computing group at MIT, which um, all of these so called modern probabilistic programming languages build on top of languages like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Okay? So they give you access to the things that neural networks are good at, but they also give you powerful tools for expressing abstract models, probabilistic generative models symbolically, and then doing powerful kinds of probabilistic inference in those, some of which are enabled by the neural network toolkit, but others use Monte Carlo or other or optimization or sophisticated ways of combining those. If you want a just very easy introduction to the idea of probabilistic programs as cognitive models, then I would say check out that probmods.org webbook there, which was written by Noah Goodman and colleagues, a little bit from me, mostly from Noah. And it's a, it's, it has a lot of runnable code examples, which are a fun way to introduce yourself to this toolkit. Now, another idea is the idea of uh, what, what I referred to briefly before as the game engine in your head. This is the idea that the tools that I think many of us in, in the computer vision community at this point, probably most people are very familiar with, these very fast approximate simulation programs for graphics, physics, and planning, the tools that were originally developed in the game industry to let a game designer make a new game and rich immersive experience very, you know, relatively quickly without having to write all that stuff from scratch, just focus on the story, the characters, the objects, okay? Um, the, the idea is that these tools um, could be one approximation, computational approximation, to the kinds of core knowledge systems that Liz Spelke, for example, and colleagues have suggested might be built into our brains. Now, we don't mean literally they're just like Unity or Unreal, but that there's some important things in common, and I'll try to, to spell that out more going on. But a key part of it is a rich symbolic language for understanding a world of objects and simulating physics. Here's a couple of animations from game physics engines. And you know, again, it's really quite remarkable to try to write out what these simulation engines can do. As Liz was saying, in, in uh, suggesting this as a way to think about core knowledge of space or other systems, right? To actually write down explicitly the equations necessary to solve for say the motion of that wrecking ball and all the blocks, you know, that would be in some sense a classical physicist nightmare, even if it's all consistent with classical mechanics. But the computational tools and the various computational shortcuts that are built into them that allow you to simulate something like this, maybe even in real time, as well as more complex fluid flows, non-rigid soft bodies, cloths, and so on. You know, I, I think we ha increasingly have to pay attention to the idea that these are not just um, powerful tools for video games, and they're also not just powerful training grounds for our AI. A lot of people in robotics and computer vision use these simulators to train, let's say, a neural network, and then the idea is we'll deploy that in the real world with some kind of sensorial transfer. The idea that we're talking about here, though, is that the game engine is actually in your head. It's the mental simulator. So that when a kid here sort of you know, sees this uh, set of blocks and this uh, toy on top of it and formulates a plan maybe to knock them over with the ball, what he's doing in his head is running a simulation to try to evaluate what might happen conditioned on the actions he could take. Okay. So we've used these kinds of tools, probabilistic, uh, or sorry, game, game style, let's say physics engines wrapped inside probabilistic programming languages or, for, or, or just generally frameworks for probabilistic inference on structured models to capture a, a, a wide range of common sensibilities, including um, explicitly things in infants or just the, what we think of as the extensions of those systems, which are there and in many ways easier to study 
quantitatively with human adults. So for example, in work that Peter Vitalia and Jess Hemrick started in our group some years ago, many others um, such as Tomer Ullman have carried on. Pete and Jess are now at DeepMind. Tomer is a uh, recently started professor at Harvard in psychology. Um, we applied these kinds of models, for example, to a number of blocks world scenes. And the idea is that we observe one or a sequence of images, that's what you see down in the lower left there, and there's first some kind of vision front end which inverts a graphics engine to, to make an estimate of the underlying world state. So with configuration of, let's say, these objects, these blocks in 3D, which is also, it's not just the input to graphics, it is the state of the physics engine. So now if you want to make a prediction, like will the stack of blocks fall over, you just have to propagate through a few steps in time in your physics engine. If you have uncertainty in the inverse graphics arrow, in that bottom up arrow there, then that uncertainty propagates through and it accounts in important ways for, for sort of quantitative uncertainty that you see in people's data. You can use these models to answer you know, many, many questions. This is a first step towards that endless array of tasks where the, the questions could be specified in natural language like English or in some symbolic language that you can query the physics engine and the probabilistic programming system with. So those questions might include, will the stack of blocks fall over? Or how likely do you think they will? Or which way will they fall? Or how far will they fall? Or what would happen if one color of blocks is much heavier than the other? Or if you see some blocks um, where they seem like they should be falling over, but they're not, um, how likely is it that one of the different kinds of materials is much heavier than the other? I want to show you just one um, task here, which is less familiar than some of them, unless you've seen me talk about intuitive physics, because I, I like this one. But I choose this one in, to demonstrate uh, how the system works, rather than something like, will the stack of blocks fall over? Again, to show the flexibility and adaptability of the system with no retraining. Because, well, we've all, back to infancy, um, stacked up blocks and seen them fall over and wondered if they're going to fall over or not. Many of us, you know, we still play the game Jenga and you do that sort of thing all the time. Here's a task which, you know, the first time you see it, you can still do it just as well as, you know, again, for some of you who might have seen this a few times, I apologize, but you'll do, you'll do exactly the same thing in this task, whether you're seeing it for the first time or the third or fourth time. So I specify the task not with a training set, but in, with a sentence in English, a question. I say, what if the table is bumped hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor? Is it more likely to be red blocks or yellow blocks? Now, it's much more fun to do this in person where everybody can shout out their answer. So I'll just tell you what, what probably most of you are thinking, especially if you see this for the first time. I mean, this one looks pretty obvious. You'd say red, right? There's more red blocks. Okay, what about here? Well, yellow, mm, red, yellow, mm, yellow, yellow, mm, red, yellow. Those are the typical answers that people give here, I think. I mean, but, but there's variance. And again, if you could hear everybody um, saying this, saying these things in a large room, you'd hear that there's variance and also some are quicker and slower than others. And those are both signatures of uncertainty. Now, how, what kind of uncertainty is this? Well, the way we model this is uncertainty in a approximate simulation of what's going on. So to illustrate one case, these are reconstructions of one of those scenes in a simple game physics engine. And then we simulate various ways you might bump the table. So here's one bump. This is a small bump. And over here, now here's a large bump. Okay. Um, and what you can see is that, well, different things happen when you have a small bump or a large bump. And if I bumped it from different angles, yet more different things would happen. But almost all of the time for a scene like this, it doesn't matter whether it's a little bump or a big bump. Basically the same thing happens at the macro level that intuitive physics recognizes, namely all of the blocks go over and few or none of the red blocks. And it doesn't matter which of those scenes is. And it also doesn't matter if you run that simulation to the end, you only have to run a few time steps like I've shown here to be able to compute the answer. And you don't have to run a high precision simulation either. I mean, you did if you wanted to track the blocks, but that would be crazy. I mean, the, the deterministic chaos involved would make it very hard for any predictive system to make precise predictions. But to just say, how, you know, is it going to be red or yellow blocks? That's, that only requires a low precision, very fast simulation. And just one or a few samples from different initial conditions could be enough to be confident of that. 
So that's the way the model works. And it's able to make quantitative uh, predictions of people's judgments. I showed a scatter plot before, by the way, and I'm sorry I didn't say what it showed, but much like this one, on all these scatter plots, the y-axis is human judgments, average of some number of people. And on the x-axis is the model prediction, the average of a few of these probabilistic approximate simulations. And whether it was a very familiar judgment, like will, how likely is this stack of blocks to fall over, or a more unfamiliar judgment, we typically find in these kinds of settings and these kinds of tasks that the, the models that I've described here can capture roughly eight, um, eight or well, sorry, I was going to say 80 to 90 percent of the variance. That's not right. The correlate around 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. So that, but that's still, you know, much more than half of the variance and um, in judgment. So they're not perfect, but they're pretty good. And Strikingly, they don't involve any training or any learning. These models are just built with some kind of structure that we think arises in your head, to the extent that an analog of this does arise, through some combination of a lot of stuff that's built in and a lot of stuff that's learned. So just to be clear, these models haven't tried to capture the learning. We're not trying to say you're born with the ability to do all these things. But but it, it's, it's quite striking that even 12-month-old infants have versions of these abilities and, and probably younger ones in, in the sense of being able to see how stable something is or will something fall and being sensitive to the rudiments of center of mass. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go into more details, but in the last few years, you know, there have literally been dozens of papers here. I've, I'm highlighting ones from, you know, students and collaborators, but there's many people who've worked in these kinds of paradigms recently of what you would call visual intuitive physics, including some really good work in the computer vision community. So if you're interested, I'm happy to share these slides and, and you know, these references. But, you know, there's, if these models have, uh, you know, really accounted for quite a number of phenomena of different sorts. Um, and I can't help putting this slide in too to address something that Liz said because Liz, uh, Liz Felke was saying at the end of her talk that unfortunately we don't know how or where objects are represented in the brain. And, and by this she means not um, object, visual object categories, um, though we actually probably know a little bit less about that than, than, than we'd like. But in particular here, again, it's like the physical object representations. But actually in some recent work that's been done in Nancy Kamwisher's lab, my colleague at MIT, we have started to uncover this, okay? So in the first study that was done by Jason Fisher, who's now a professor at Johns Hopkins, he took tasks like the ones I showed you, like a question of um, will these blocks fall to the left or the right, to the red or yellow region, or other tasks like the one that was played here briefly where you had to make a, you, you saw either a sort of an inanimate set of physical objects in motion or a more of a social scene, and you had to do a sort of two step or two second prediction into the future task and a number of other kinds of physical object tasks and used fMRI to say which part of the brain seems to be involved in these computations and found a network of frontal and parietal areas, basically premotor areas and areas that are that have often been thought of for representing space and action in the parietal cortex and together have often been characterized as representation or as, as networks for action planning or tool use. Um, recently, Sarah Schwetman showed in a follow-up paper that you can decode from these regions an invariant representation of objects mass. And what invariant means is that I can show you many different scenes like these ones here. Um, somehow only one of the videos playing. I'm going to have to play them all. Okay. Um, and notice that some of these flashing things look heavy, some look light. Um, here's another scene. There's like this hair dryer, and sometimes the hair dryer makes something look heavy or light. Um, or, or really heavy. Um, here's another way to show the mass of an object, okay? Um, or we have scenes like these, these kind of inclined plane sliding situations. And in, and in each of these cases, you get dynamic information about how heavy something is. The static appearance doesn't tell you, but this part of the brain represents the mass in a way that you can train a classifier to decode from a pattern of brain activity from one of these settings and cross decode from the other, suggesting that it's an invariant representation. Very recently, um, another, another great, great person in Nancy's lab, Pramod, this is just hot off the presses from the most recent VSS conference, um, has shown that the same regions also encode ha or have a decodable representation of stability. That actually hadn't been shown before. And he showed this not just for block scenes, but for various photographs of bottles and people. Um, again, pretty weird scenes that you probably haven't seen before. They're not ecologically valid. <laughs> hopefully, but they might have been staged photographs. And yet, um, the, uh, you, you can decode from this 
representations of stability that are the same representations as, as uh, from, the, from the blocks type stimuli. And you can also show that um, when people um, are, are seeing these scenes, they, they actually activate the region more as if, we, this is very speculative so far, but as if there's actually a simulation process where the more unstable it is, the longer you have to, the more, the more intensity there is simulating. And it's not something you see, it's not just an implied motion effect, because so you don't see greater activation in visual cortex, only in these parts of object cortex. Um, lastly, for intuitive physics, we've used these models to actually capture um, classic data from infants. So here's a study from 12 month old infants that was done by Erno Teglas in the lab of Luca Bonatti. And we used an early version of these kind of models to capture the classic kind of um, data that you, that you use to study infants looking time data. Um, the way these experiments worked is that infants saw scenes like the one you're seeing here, these gumball or lottery machines. And the objects, the objects would bounce around for a little while, then there'd be a short period of occlusion and one of the objects would appear, either the blue one or the yellow one. And, th and the question was, how surprising is that appearance? And across 12 different conditions, you could vary um, which color was more common, um, whether the object which appeared ultimately outside of the, outside of the door was close or far from the door, um, at the point of occlusion and how long the occlusion was, zero, one, or two seconds. And the model that we built just modeled objects as a simple kind of constrained random walk. So there wasn't really any notion of gravity, um, just things didn't, didn't pass through other things. So they kind of bounce off other solid objects. And that was enough to quantitatively predict looking time, namely that infants looked longer at lower probability events. And this was just one of the first, and now there've been other studies where people are trying to quantitatively predict infant's sense of surprise, as you might measure through looking time, using these kinds of probabilistic inference on top of physics simulation programs. Now, I just have a few minutes left, but I want to talk about learning <laughs> because, you know, I'm in very interested in learning. I think many people here are. And so far, again, I have to emphasize, there's been, there's been no learning in these models. So they're in trying to capture the kind of things that you start with. Now, one possibility is that um, what you actually start with is, is not anything like this, that instead that these systems are learned mostly from scratch, something like end-to-end -end learning for raw pixels, maybe in a self-supervised way or some kind of um, you know, reinforcement learning with some intrinsic motivation. There have been a number of attempts within the, say, computer vision and computational neuroscience community to explore this. And I think this is interesting, and I'm, I, you know, I'm happy that this work is going on, and I even collaborate on some of it, although I don't think that it's probably the right solution, at least as far as accounting for um, what infants do. Um, but it's worth exploring and it's, and it's uh, quite open to you know, seeing where that goes. Um, but for example, um, an early system that was built from Facebook AI, from Adam Lehrer and colleagues tried to learn in an end-to-end -end supervised way to classify block towers, how stable they were. This system was much better than people. Um, actually, or was significantly better than people, but it, it really had trouble generalizing to scenes that were even slightly different from the ones that um, it was tested on. Or in Dan Yeamans' group, for example, um, work that was done by Nick Haber and others, um, they used uh, you know, the kind of but what you could call a curiosity-based um, objection, sort of self-surprise um, with a sort of adversarial um, learner and world modeler. And showed that you could get a, a, a sort of a very rough baby-like simulator to learn some basics of object perception detection and object-based attention. Okay. And again, I think this is interesting work, but I think it's very far from building anything like the kind of systems that we've been talking about. Worth pursuing, but, that, but very far from that. So the approach that, that I've been focusing on more, again, with various colleagues and students and postdocs, is looking at learning in various ways, learning in the game engine, maybe learning the game engine itself and saying, what do you have to add on top of that to learn everything else? So for example, in one, one project that I think many people here might know, this is work that was led by Jia Jin Wu, who was recently graduated from MIT and is now just starting at Stanford as an assistant professor. Um, in a Neurox paper from a few years ago, he, he introduced an idea, well, first actually in a CVPR paper from the, the year before, uh, of de-rendering using neural networks, starting with seg you know, seg segmentation like MASCAR CNN, um, but to use the system to invert a graphics engine to basically perceive the, th the 3D um, object shapes and locations from 
images. So kind of compositional, learned compositional scene understanding. And then in this paper, he coupled this to a physics engine to be able to, for example, take these scenes that were collected by the Facebook group actually, and then be able to take a single scene and predict what's going to happen. So to take what you'll see in these movies is on the left, you see the actual movie. And then on the right, you'll see the system imagining what's going to happen next. Okay? And you can see that it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Try these scenes here. Just think for a second what's going to happen. Here's what actually happens. And then on the right is the system's imagination. And here's one more. And you can see that th you know, this is something which is able to um, generalize in a, in a fairly strong way. It can generalize much better to different numbers of blocks. And it's really, it's really capturing something of what's going on in the 3D and, and the physical dynamics because it has that built in. Um, this, these same kinds of tools have been used by Ilker Yildirim and others to actually try to model some of the things I talked about, including the brain network. So um, this is just an advertisement if you're interested to, for example, a uh, current opinion in neurobiology paper by Ilker and, and Jajun and Nancy Kamisher and myself. Um, taking these kinds of models, these learned de-renderers, okay, and suggesting how by coupling them to physics engines and also analogous kinds of learned inference networks. So for example, using recurrent neural networks defined on graph nets to give sort of learned, not just de-rendering, but actual physical dynamic inference machinery. Again, this is very speculative, but might provide at least one way to start to think about the computational or the neural computational architecture of what Kamisher has called the object-driven cortex, which is the part of the brain that starts in the visual system, but then goes to these parietal and frontal parietal networks where we think intuitive physics is implemented. And then most recently at the last NeurIPS, Kevin Smith, Jajun, Liz, me, and Tomer Ullman, and Tomer is the senior author leading this team, along with Kevin and Jajun, um, took this idea and tried to actually model and make a, made a, a nice but still first step towards a model of infant intuitive physics. So the idea is saying, well, maybe something like a full mental game engine is where the adult gets to, but the infant starts with something much simpler, where there's only very coarse approximate representations of objects, very simple dynamics, okay? But still probabilistic inference um, that allows you to make sense of what you can't see and also to understand the sources of surprise. So this system takes the kind of de-rendering pipeline that Jajun and colleagues have developed um, and de-renders it into, de-renders an image or a sequence of images into the state of a game's physics engine, okay? The key here is that though we show this, ob this system many different kinds of objects, it doesn't, as Liz say, pay attention, or as Liz, as Liz has, has identified, and, and others in, in research, it doesn't pay attention to most of the visual details. Most of the things that you care about in computer vision, this system ignores. It tries to treat everything basically as like a cuboid or ellipsoid, whether it's a ball or a, a tree or um, a, a rabbit or a truck or whatever, okay? And again, that's consistent with what we've seen that, that the infant physics system initially isn't that sensitive to those kinds of shape features. Um, then the system makes predictions about what might happen by propagating through the physics engine. And then there's one other also interesting thing here, which is it allows for what we call these repair processes, which are just things that violate its physics, but can be seen as outside interventions or resamples from the prior. So like maybe an object gets suddenly introduced, like kind of like magically, um, uh, by, some, by some agent that I didn't know about, or an object moves, teleports, or an object suddenly stops or starts to move. Okay, these are all things which are surprising. They violate physics at one level, but not at a higher level because they're consistent with the prior, just not the posterior of the scene. So it could have happened in some other scene, it just doesn't look like this one. And the that allows the system to have a structured kind of surprise signal. And since I'm running out of time, I'm not gonna go to the, go to the details of how that works, but check out this paper if you're interested. Crucially, the de-renderer is trained on these very unstructured scenes like this, but then it's tested, the system is tested on a different kind of scene, different sets of scenes, which have the same kinds of objects and graphics, but different objects. And crucially, these scenes now represent the kind of classic infant experiments, like where an object goes behind a screen and then maybe magically appears to teleport to the other side of a solid object or two objects go behind a screen and only one appears, or an object goes behind or, or comes out from a split screen and then another ob uh, passes through to another object or various things like this. I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm not going to go to the details, but the key is that for these different scenes, the system is able to track the objects both when it can see them and when it can't see them. And then it computes a surprise score when something happens that doesn't fit its expectation. Okay. In a scene like this, there's a double surprise because first an object doesn't appear when you expect it to come out the other side of the occluder, but then when the occluder is, is put down, you expect it to still be there and then it's not there. And then you say, oh wow, it did just stop, it disappeared. So we can get these kinds of signals for many, many different scenes and compare them with the behavior that it, it, the judgments that infants have shown, as well as compare them with other more sort of generic off the shelf learning systems that don't have this kind of object-based physics built in. And the bottom line is that the model that has that kind of physics built in does, is the only one of, of these models that is significantly above chance um, relative to, uh, in, all, or sorry, in all these different categories. Um, you can also, and this is new work that the team has done, you can also look at the detailed time course of surprise. When does a surprising event happen? Or when is, what, when is a source of surprise generated? And the system is able to find that too. Um, a more interesting kind of learning, which again, I, I, I can only advertise um, because I, I don't have much more time, is work that Kelsey Allen and Kevin Smith have done in our group. And this is on something which they call the virtual tools game. It's a game that's, that's now we're starting to take learning towards the, towards the kind of flexible problem solving and new tasks that, that you know, again, is at the heart of common sense. So if you imagine, you know, you're trying to set up your tent in the wilderness, you forgot your hammer, so you look for something that you could use to hammer a stake into the ground, you're probably not gonna use the pine cone, eh, probably not the stick, and then maybe one of these rocks, you might try one, and if it doesn't work, try the other. So they built this really cool game, which I'm just showing you a few scenes from here, in which people drop objects into a scene and have to, have to achieve a goal of getting, let's say, the red ball into the green goal. And there's many different ways to make this an interesting challenge. Um, I should say this was inspired in part by some of the physics games that you can play on your phone, such as the game Brain It On. And there's a closely related, but interestingly, importantly different um, task that, that people in the computer vision community developed, the FHYRE, P-H-Y-R-E task, uh, that was developed by a Facebook team. And I strongly recommend you guys checking out, if you're interested in this, both of these kinds of challenges for common sense intuitive physics. What Kelsey and Kevin showed is that by taking this idea of approximate probabilistic simulation and putting that in the loop of a very simple kind of trial and error learning system where you mentally, you, you, you draw a prior on possible object interactions or you draw samples of possible ways you could drop an object into the scene and then you, you run that forward in your, in your intuitive physics simulator to see if you think it's gonna solve the problem. Try a few variations. When you find one that seems like it might work, you try it in the real world and if it doesn't work, you then update your prior based on by, based on basically how well it did or didn't work and where it seemed to come off. And this, this model, this simple model, captures fairly well how people solve many levels in this game. Um, you can check here, this is the uh, HTTP link to the tools game, and there's a paper on this that's about to come out in PNAS, which um, you, can, you can find an early version of online in the archive. And I'll just say the model is able to reasonably well capture both people's learning curves where you learn in very fast. So this is a kind of learning that you learn in just a few trials. Um, these are the, the x axis here of learning curves is like, um, you know, up to 10 or 20 trials at most and most of these levels are learned within within just about five trials. Okay. It can also capture relatively well where people actually put objects. Okay. Um, not always, there are some things that it doesn't get. And that points to what's really missing from just you know, a pure simulation based approach. Like we think this is the heart of common sense core physics, but you also need, for example, more sophisticated kind of symbolic planning. So here I would just point for people who don't know the work of Mark Toussaint, He's not that well known in the computer vision community, but he does really wonderful work in robotics and other areas of AI. And Kelsey and Kevin and I played a very small role in a paper that was at RSS uh, in 2018 that's really mo almost all Mark's work, showing how to take this idea of simple kinds of physics models as the first stage of a hierarchical so-called task in motion planner where the higher level, there's higher levels of symbolic search through spaces of sub goals where they might be like, pick up this tool or slide this object or throw this thing or put this on that. And then you use that, you use a high level of symbolic search over sub goals to formulate a complex plan like you're seeing this robotic agent doing here. But then there's, an, there's sort of a lower inner loop of physics-based trajectory optimization. And this is one way that we think you could start to get to more interesting kinds of common sense. 
And the last thing I'll just leave us with is the real interesting learning problem that we all want to solve, which we don't know how to solve, which is how could you actually build the physics engine itself, right, through some combination of evolution and development. There's great data that has been collected. I mean, it's, it's interesting, like as a, as a cognitive modeler, I look and say, oh, what amazing data. Liz, of course, pointed out all the ways in which we're missing a lot of really important data. So I don't want to, I don't disagree with that either. But we have inspiring data from Liz's work, from Rene Bayerjan, from decades of great infant research about what seem to be different kinds of stages of intuitive physics that infants go through over the first 12 to 18 months as they start to learn about the world. And we can start to ask, can we capture these different stages as something like these different, you know, a, a, a sequence of inc increasingly developing kind of richer game engine type representations? And then learn, you know, learning is some problem pro process of like searching through the space of game engine programs. Now, this is a really hard problem, right? It's not like learning in a neural network where you where you can apply stochastic gradient descent. The space of programs like game engine simulator programs is way too complex. Okay, um, but what we're trying to work towards, and this is where I want to end things, and just sort of a pointer to work that is to be done is this idea that you could call the child as coder or the child as hacker. The idea that if you think about all the different activities you do as when you're writing code, okay, all the different ways you try to make your code better on a on day-to-day -day basis in any big project you're doing, all of those have analogs in children's learning. So sometimes you have an existing code base and you just tune the parameters. That's like learning in a neural network. But other times you write new code, you extend or you fix debug functions, you, you write new functions or rewrite old functions, you write new libraries, you might write a whole new language, right? You might translate from one language to another in a language that you made up, okay? All those different activities of coding, we think of those as, way, as ways to algorithmize the, and, and bring or bring to the algorithmic level the processes of learning that would be required to build up a, a simulation program. Now, we don't yet know how to capture these in machine terms, but there's exciting first steps of progress that are coming from the community in what's called program synthesis um, or inductive program synthesis. So for example, a, a student at MIT, Kevin Ellis, um, who works with me and Armando Solar Lazama, recently defended his thesis where a key part of his thesis was a system that combines neural network learning to guide the search for programs with a symbolic ability to build out new programming libraries. And this is just one example of a tool set that might start to start to be able to address this kind of problem of how we could get model building. He has a paper on this, which I think is just going on archive maybe today. So take a look at that if you're interested. His system is called Dream Coder because it involves a kind of wake sleep learning, interestingly analogous, I think, to what Liz was talking about. Um, in terms of like learning through dreamlike simulations. Okay, so just to wrap up then, um, you know, where are we? How close are we towards fulfilling AI's oldest dream? Well, we're still pretty far, <laughs> but we're starting to take some small steps. And that's because we in computational cognitive science and in AI have, have started finally to pay attention to the important le lessons coming from the basic science of how babies and young children's minds work, how their brains are built. And we're starting to have some tools on the engineering side to be able to render some of these insights into effective computational models. But we're still just at the beginning. You know, there are really hard scaling and search problems when it comes to learning code like that. I, I, I have a feeling Allison might talk about some of those because that's something she's drawn a lot of interesting attention to. And I, you know, I think really we all have to, I hope, hopefully people are inspired and excited to work on these problems, but also it really, the most, maybe the most exciting thing is we're just at the beginning. So if you're interested and you haven't worked in this area, I hope that, uh, th that you will join all of us in this big program, thanks. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, so we're running a little bit behind, but maybe we can take one or two questions. Um, and I see that there's one question in the in the chat already. Um, and it looks like I'll, I should just read this one out. Uh, so the question is from Marin uh, Vlastelica. And it is, we know that we can generalize well with causal models. But how does the reward cost objective function come into play when learning reasoning enabled agents? Is it actually clear what we want to optimize for? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, uh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure that I fully understand it. So I think maybe what you're getting at is what is the role of 
So I, I talked a little bit at the beginning and a little bit towards the end about not just building models of the world, but actually using them to solve tasks and the importance of um, being able to solve a wide range of different tasks. And I think that points to maybe the, the, the question, you know, where the question is coming from, right? That if, if we're building an agent that is just going to do one thing or one sort of class of things that we can characterize pretty well in advance, then, then it makes sense to use the, the structure of that task, including the, the rewards for the goals and the particular costs and sort of propagate that through or optimize the model for that. Okay. Um, but I think many of us who study common sense, the point is that it's not like that. This is knowledge that can be used for any and all tasks that are even in your space to even think about, and many tasks that you haven't ever encountered before at the time when you're forming this knowledge. So it's really not very clear how to use any kind of um, you know, utility structure of a task to guide your learning. Now, the, the main way that people have, I think, thought about this is you know, sometimes coming from the curiosity world um, or the idea of curiosity and intrinsic motivation and to say, well, maybe I can make up proxy tasks for myself. Like, can I surprise myself and then use that to guide my actions and interventions, right? Um, so for example, Deepak Patak and colleagues have some really nice work that's been very influential and very well known doing that. And a number of other, that's, it, that was more or less the same thing that, that Dan Yeamans on the cognitive AI side also talked about for, for John that I mentioned before. But again, I'll just come back to some points that Laura Schultz has been emphasizing recently. Um, and that we've been starting to explore with other students and, I'm, and, and others are too. Deepak has some new work also kind of going in this direction that he recently uh, put out. So I would encourage people to check that out too, is the idea of systems that, that don't, aren't just guided by a notion of curiosity as surprise, but are really trying to form their own goals and really make up their own reward structures and maybe even construct their own cost structures. This is, this is work that, uh, or I'm referring, I'm thinking here of work that Jinyi Chu, who's a PhD student at MIT working with Laura has have developed and they have some papers coming out on this quite soon. So check out that on the, on the cognitive development side. And I, I think really this is again, just a pointer to where we need to be thinking. And one of the, one of the best places we have a lot to learn from um, developmental psychology still is how to think about a, an agent that autonomously structures its own tasks and goals and, and what role that plays in learning. Cool, um, thank you. So I, uh, I think there's a lot more to dig into obviously, uh, but we'll have the panel later and maybe we should move on to yes, the- send, Yes, but by all means, send me the, or either send me the questions in a text or I can try to download them if that's possible from the chat. And I will, if I have anything good to say about any of them, I will try to write you by email. Uh, or I don't know if that's possible, if I can. Otherwise, maybe we can bring it back up in the panel along with all the other questions that, that come up. Okay, that's great. Thanks yeah, I see there's a few questions in the chat already. And yeah, I'll be interested to see them and try to respond. Okay, thanks everyone. Great. Okay, thanks so much, Josh. Really fascinating as always.